All right. Have we gotten something out of this? And Althea, are you going to stick around for the show? You can be here as long as you want. I'll take you home. Does this All right, mean it's so on or green mean it's on? Today we've got Paige Martin who's going to go it. through okay, thank you. how to get unstuck with your business. And for some of you, you're like, I'm brand new. It's great real estate here in Houston. There'll be no issues ever, and I'm doing really well. <laughs> Our average agent does about a half a transaction a month. And remember, if you do the 80-20 principle, real estate is about a 90-10. Anybody know what that principle is called? Pareto principle. And it stands true in every industry that you're going to have your top producers and you're going to have the people that kind of just got in as a hobby. Like we have the CEO of one of the oil company's nieces working here, right? Drives a Lamborghini. She's never going to sell a house. She's probably the Houstonian right now. And that's okay. She's all right with it. She wants a license in Memorial. But she's always going to be in that zero percentile. She's never going to hunt for it. And that's all right. And we knew that going in. But that's not you. Right? You guys want to get to that next level, and that's why I was excited when Paige said, hey, let me help out. I'd like to come in and share what I'm doing. Now, this next part's really exciting, so listen up. Paige, how many, how many referral partners do you have already? Seven. So there's seven people that Paige actually shoots referrals to. And she looks for really, really good agents. And there isn't one person in here right now that doesn't think, I'm a really good agent. There are very specific criteria that she looks for, and she's not going to tell you what those are, and neither am I. But just know she's looking for five more. Of those seven, six of them are making like over 200000 some even more than that. Okay? And all their, the majority of their business is being fed by Paige, and they do a heck of a job on the follow-up. But with that, she is looking for five more. So the idea is not to come up afterwards and go, hey, pick me. Please um, don't. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't, but, but just think, with that information that we g gave you, she's looking for five more. Sadly, I'm predicting she'll probably get one or two because the rest will not meet the criteria. Prove me wrong because she has so much business that she would like to give to you as a referral partner. Okay. So Paige joined us eight years ago, year one top agent, year two top agent, every year for the last eight years. But this is a lady who knows her business at a very, very high level. And let me tell you how high that is. Two years ago, she hit that 60 million mark. And we're at the annual banquet where we do our award ceremony. And beforehand, I'm telling her how awesome she is. And she says, my business will drop in half this next year. I'm like, that's, that's horrible. Drop what, in what's half. What's horrible? I'm going to drop in half this next year. She knew her business. She said, my price point, instead of being 800000 is going to go down into like the threes. She knew that, and she knew that it was tied to the oil and how her business metrics is displaced when there's a challenge in the market. Knowing your numbers allows you to attack the situation. She knew what she was going to hit. She was off a little bit. She did more than $30 million, which is pretty darn good, and $30 million would have been fine. But she did in the 40s, but she knew that she was going to drop, and she knew her price point was going to drop. Know your numbers. Know where your business is coming from. Know your client base and work with them accordingly. And when there's a change in your, in your market, those of you that did REOs in 2009, well, that business went away in 2013 completely. And I had many of you crying in your beer saying, oh my gosh, that business is gone. It's being in the market of the moment. And that's what Paige is going to get into today, how it all comes together and how she works it. And then from there, we're going to ask some questions. And you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions. She's our number one agent for all of Keller Williams in Texas. And she's in that top probably in the top five in the country for individual agents. So I'm very excited that Paige has joined us today and she's going to share with us. Please welcome Paige. Hi. Well, Michael, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I, you, know, you know, two things in real estate. One, you're only as good as your next deal. And two, never, ever, ever believe your own marketing. So I appreciate the kind words, but at the end of the day, I'm just an agent um, who puts my boots to the ground every day. Um, and if I'm completely honest with you all, I really don't like January. Because you spend the entire year working really hard, and then January comes, and you get to do it all over again. And that's hard for me. So what I want to teach on today is as much 
of the information that I internally need to hear from myself, um, as hopefully it is for you. So for the repeat offenders, those of you who have sat through my presentations before, you're going to hear some similar themes of things that you've heard in the past. Um, this business is not rocket science, but getting the basics down is incredibly important, and oftentimes we fail to do that. Um, but I always like to kind of get a sense of who is in the crowd. So how many of you have been in the business for less than a year? Okay, great. One to three. Three to five. Five to ten. More than ten. Yes, because, <laughs> because the more than ten, these are our experts. We have a great brain trust here in this office. And so those of you who have been in the office for more than ten years, thank you for your service, for your work in the industry, and for being mentors to the rest of us. So we're grateful for you guys and for you new agents. Those are really good resources for you to look forward to. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I really wish I had a magic pill to give you today. Um, I stopped by the pharmacy and they're fresh out, so um, there's no fairy tale real estate happily ever after. Uh, so with that, let's kind of get down to it and talk about being stuck. First step towards getting somewhere is to decide that you were not, not going to stay where you are. Now this would look great on a vision board. You print it out, put it on the wall, but until you internally decide that you are going to make the choice to not do what you have always been doing, then you're going to stay exactly where you are. And I'm going to see you back here next year. So as we go through things today, the other way to say this is unless you're willing to address your roots, you cannot change your fruit. So I'm going to talk a lot about root stuff and a little bit of fruit stuff, but I really want you to come away from this process with the concept of, am I willing to do the hard work that it's going to take to put my business at the next level? So Shakespeare said it, to thine own self be true, and it starts with this concept right here. How many of you know what play that's from? It's Hamlet. I was an English major, so I know random stuff like that. But when we talk about real estate, you really need to know yourself. And every year I go through the exercise of asking these kinds of questions. Why are you even a real estate agent? Right? That's a fair question to ask. Are you in the business because it looks fun on TV? Your neighbor said it was super easy and you were going to make a bazillion dollars in the first month? Are you in the business because you care about helping people? Because at the end of the day, this is a helping profession. It's what you do. You take care of people's, most often, the largest asset in their entire portfolio. Y'all, that's significant. And we are called legally and ethically to provide these people with a fiduciary duty. So if you're not willing to do that, and you're here because you want to be on TV, you might want to rethink what your motivations are, because unless your motivations are true, you will have trouble reaching the next level in this business. We're very fortunate here at Keller Williams that you have the opportunity to have a DISC test or a KPA done. How many have had both? Oh, guys, y'all need to get a DISC and a KPA. These are two great tests. It's one of those kind of personality tests where you answer the questions and then voila, it says, you know, I should be a fortune teller. Or, no, not exactly. But it gives you really great insight. I find that my DISC and my KPA, when you actually read and study it, are very true to who I am. So then that brings the case up. Are you really supposed to be an individual agent? Right? Because as an individual agent, You've got a lot of tasks to do, and very few people, I can't think of one, is great at all of the tasks that an individual agent has to do. So if you find that you love the compliance piece, and you check with your DISC and your KPA, and that's the perfect match, maybe you find that an individual agent role is not the right role for you. And looking for opportunities to partner with other agents who love to be with the clients and hey, to file paperwork. And maybe there's a way to partner. So have you considered joining a team? Have you considered partnering? Have you looked at staff opportunities here at the office? And then Michael's gonna grimace when I say this, but the other frank answer is, 
do you need to consider another career? If we talk about, frankly, <laughs> being stuck, when you evaluate yourself and what your motives are, that will lead you to some truths. And if you're not willing to do that, it's very difficult to get unstuck. So in my business, it is very much about what I measure. When I started in the business, I ran around like a chicken with my head cut off, fielding whatever came in, whenever it came in, however it came in, and just ran through my days like this. And by the end of the day, you're on the floor, mad at everybody, hungry, and it's time for bed. You can't measure that. So if you don't measure it, how can I manage it? It's very important that you start thinking about the aspects of your business that you can measure. And I'm guaranteeing you, you think that you have nothing to measure, but you do. So first of all, if you don't know what the problem is, how do you even fix it? Why are you getting stuck and where are you getting stuck? These are questions when you're evaluating yourself that you need to be asking. What is your business plan and how do you spend your money? Do you know? Or are you just writing checks out to Zillow each month because it's fun to watch that money fly out the door? Do you know what your ROI is on the money that you're spending? All of these things can be measured. Where are you getting your leads from? You're like, oh, well, I got, I got some leads from an open house. I got some leads from referrals. I got some leads. Do you actually know the percentage of where your lead source is coming from? Because if you did, you need to be doubling down on the where those sources actually come from. But if you don't know, how do you improve it? So the question really becomes, what are you measuring? So in my business, we measure a ton of stuff. But the three easiest pieces that my referral partners and I measure are this. Calls, meetings, closings. And there's a ratio between how all those work. And we track this so we know this for our particular team. We know the number of calls you're making each day. This should be, if you want to perform on my team, no less than 14 calls per week. If you're making 14 calls per week, calls is what gets you to a meeting. If you don't call, they're not meeting with you. This is not rocket science, but sometimes we think it is. So the number of calls to get to a meeting, it should be around 9 to 15. If you're below 9, it means you're really good with your call scripts. If you call 15 people and can't get a meeting, it means your problem is your scripts, your call scripts when you're on the phone. So it's a very easy metric to track. So you know if you're calling 9 to 15 people and are not getting a meeting, you need to practice your call scripts. Then we go to how many meetings to get a closing. And for our team, that's in around 2 to 5. And if those aren't the numbers, the weakness is in your client presentation. So we can track and know where is the issue. Is the issue are you're not making the calls? Is the issue you're making the calls but not getting the meetings? Or you're getting the meetings and not getting to closing? And from there, we can fix the problem. I'll take questions at the end if that's all right. So here's a sample metric for you, one of the things that we go through. If you want to make $100,000, that means you need to sell about $4 million worth of property, give or take. Now, it's really 3.3, .3, but you know, you got some expenses. You might give something back here or there. So let's just say four. Four million dollars, that means your production monthly needs to be $350,000. Average home price sales in Houston is about 250. dollars Now, you would augment this math to be whatever your numbers are, but assume it's 250. dollars That means you need 1.4 deals a month. Okay, that's pretty reasonable that one, one month is going to be one, one month is going to be two, but 1.4. 1, 1 then it means you need four meetings to get to that buyer. Okay, now we know we need about 11 calls to get to that meeting. That means you need 62 calls a month to hit your number. 62 calls, I'll be honest, sounds like a lot. It's two a day. So when you measure and you know the numbers, two a day is reasonable. That's something you can do. But when you look at the big hairy goal and go, oh, there's so much work, I'll never get it done, that's why you measure. Because when you know what the facts and the numbers are, it makes 
chewing off this big piece called real estate attainable. So if your takeaway from that last slide was, I don't want to make two calls a day, then maybe you need to look for another career. If your takeaway was, I know lots of people, but I don't know who to call each day, then you've got a systems and an organizational problem. And that's where you need to spend time and your focus with your database. And if your answer is, I'm happy to make two calls a day, but I don't have anybody to call, then hang out and we'll get to that at the very end. You know, I took piano as a child, and I didn't mind playing the piano, but I hated to practice. Hated it. In fact, the only practice I actually did was at the piano lesson with the teacher. And while that was all fine and good, when we went to the piano recital at the end of the year, and you dress up in your Sunday best, and all the parents are there with their VCRs, that's back when there were VCRs, and video cameras. I absolutely bombed the recital in front of everyone in the room because I failed to prepare. And in real estate, I'll be real clear with you guys, this is all a preparations game. So do you practice your buyer and listing presentations? Do you have one? I can't tell you the number of hours I have spent in front of a mirror practicing my buyer presentations. Because what I know is the more that I practice, I'm going to internalize that. And when I internalize it, then it just becomes a part of who I am. So I don't have to really think about what am I going to say next, because I've already done all the prep work. I've already prepared. Do you shadow agents to learn? And this is really for your new agents. And when I had the people raise their hand who've been 10 years or longer, these people have seen some stuff. Ask if you're new. Ask to shadow an agent. But when you ask, be willing to give value in return. This is an even keel. If you're going to shadow an agent, in return, help them out. See how you can help in the system. But it's a great way to learn, especially if you are one that needs to see it modeled to learn it instead of just doing it on your own. And then what are you doing? Are you constantly increasing your knowledge and competency? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But ultimately, I want you to what we call know your lines, OK? So I've listed just a few small lines that you should know. These are questions that you will get at every dinner party that you ever attend as long as you're a real estate agent. How's the market? Is it a good time to buy or sell? Where can I get a deal? Or what's the next up and coming neighborhood? My favorite, are you busy? And that's always a fun one. How long have you been in the business? And I want to specifically come back to that one in a second. What part of town do you work? And if your answer is, I work at all, that ain't the answer. No one can be that great at the entire city of Houston. We sprawl 600 square miles. You'd spend your whole day in the car before you ever covered one inch to the other. And then there's always a script at the end for asking for referrals, depending on how, how the conversation goes. I want to go to how long have you been in the business? Because for your new agents, that's a hard question. Um, Paige, yes. um, everyone who's taking pictures, this is all being recorded. right? So you'll get a much better shot of the actual recording. You don't have to take pics. So uh, yeah, I can remember my first deal that first year, that lonely first year. And um, but gosh, I was horrified if, it, if my client ever knew they were my first. I mean, you don't want to be like, it's my first rodeo. Hope it works out. You know, nobody wants to be the client that goes through that with you, unless it's your parents, because they care about you and love you and want you to, you know, be able to pay your rent. So one of the things that for new agents, you, when we talk about shadowing and partnering, you may be well served to find a seasoned agent that will mentor you that when you answer this question, your answer is, you know, I've, I've recently joined Keller Williams and I have a great partner and together we've been in the business for 15 years. Right? So you've got a resource, makes you look a little more talented than you are. So think about things of how you're going to answer the scripts. Because if your answer is, just got my license yesterday, they're like, bye. 
Because they know that you don't know how the market is. They know how the market is. So finding what your answers are to this are going to be real key in how you internalize knowing your lines. For those of you who have been with me previously, you know that I preach this a lot. Competency leads to confidence. When you are competent at your role, and by the way, the code of ethics requires you to be competent. When you are competent, you will gain this internal confidence that allows for you to present in a way that doesn't necessarily even make sense. But it's important that you spend time gaining that competency. So questions are, where do you need training? Have you sat through Maryland's class? I mean, if you did, none of us probably ever write another contract again, but um, <laughs> that's OK. That she, that's, that's her job. Have you been to Jack's training? Are you going back online through our Keller Williams YouTube channel and watching previous trainings? We've got trainings in the office. You can get continuing ed. Figure out, again, measure where you're weak and start working to, to gain competency in those areas. The other as aspect is your competency in the market. What market updates are you reading? What stats are you studying? Those of you who have heard me previously, you hear me say, you need, when you meet with buyers and sellers, at least to know three stats about where you are. What the average price per square footage is. What's the average price sell? How average days on market? Not rocket science. Easy to find in HAR. So it's not information that nobody has. It's just that if you're going to be competent, you need to know those answers. Because ultimately, if the client is looking to you to be the expert and you don't know the answer, why would they trust you? So I want to talk a little bit about buyers and sellers because as you're planning what you want this year to look like, um, I think these statistics are important. Michael covered a lot of this in a previous team meeting, um, so I'm going to hit sort of some high points on this, uh, but I think they are worth knowing as you're planning. How buyers find their agents. 42% are between a referral, 12% a repeat client. So guys, look, if you're not spending time working referrals, you're missing out on 42% of the business. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any previous clients, so I don't have anybody to refer me. You know that there's lots of people who can refer. They don't just have to be people who have worked with you before. So get rid of your limiting beliefs and think that you are not capable of having referrals. We're going to talk a little bit more on the, the repeat client when we get to a seller slide, but what I find is really interesting. 100% are interviewed. 89% actually say they would use their agent or refer. When you add 42 to 12, that's not 89. Why is that? They would do it, they would refer you, they would use you again because you neglected to stay in front of them after the deal was done. You have let the relationship decline. Done, made my money, I'm out. And that is why if you will not stay in front of your clients, another agent will be waiting in the wings and scoop them up. Uh-oh. Oh, yay. Look. Okay, so the other thing to talk about, how buyers initially contact their agents. Phone calls, talk in person, email, they want a relationship. Extremely important. How many of you actually like to talk on the phone? Not very many of you. Yeah, I hate it too. It is the crux of our business. They need to hear you. They need to hear your voice. It's important that you are willing to pick up the phone and call. It's one of the reasons why in my referral network we track calls. If you're not willing to call, you probably need to look elsewhere for a job. Seven to ten buyers only meet with one agent. Do you know what this means? It means you stand up and you're, and you're batting for the Astros. You got a 70% chance of hitting a home run every time you're at bat. They're not looking for excuses to find other agents. But if you're not competent in what you're doing and you don't express that to them, they will go elsewhere. I love this slide. How buyers did not find their agents. 6% found their agents at open houses. Now, I do not want your takeaway from this conversation to be, Paige said not to work open houses. Because <laughs> that is not what I'm telling you. When you measure where your buyers and sellers come from, did they come from open houses? If you're the open house king or queen, then you need to blow those open houses out of the water. Now, if you said, I did two deals 
and one of them came from an open house, well, then we probably need to find some other ways to build that business. But here's why you work an open house. Because you need to practice your lines. So do you want to sit down at the biggest buyer meeting of your life when somebody's trying to get you to help them sell a $3 million house? Or would you rather practice at an open house where if you fall all over yourself, it's not the end of the world, somebody else is going to walk in in a few minutes and it's going to be okay. You use open houses as an opportunity to practice your craft. They're not finding you guys from newspapers, they're not finding it from direct mail, and they're not finding it from advertising knickknacks. So when you go back to your metrics and you see how you're spending your money, you might want to compare with actually how valuable that really is. What buyers care about? 97% honest and integrity. How do you show that, right? I'm honest, I'm, I have integrity. You need to build your online reviews. You need to use the HAR rating system. You need to use LinkedIn. Well, I haven't had very many clients, so I don't, I don't know. You have friends. They can talk about what a great person you are. You have previous colleagues. Use who you have, but people are going online and trusting reviews. So if you're not showing that, you're not hitting the top thing that buyers care about. The other aspect, 93% care about responsiveness. 93, 92 care about knowledge, either of the process or of the market. We've talked about competency, so it covers those last two. I want to talk about responsiveness. Y'all, we're real bad. I know that it, on a Friday at 5 o'clock, you're tired. But when that buyer emails you and you don't bother to get back to them until Monday afternoon at noon, they're gone. Why, why would they even care what you had to say after you made them wait? Now, do I like to wait? No. Do you like to wait? No. But for some reason, we think the potential clients we have should have to wait. That's not how this world works. And it's unfortunate, but if you don't respond quickly to them, they will move on until somebody stops them from moving forward. So here's what buyers don't care about. Mm, they don't care that you're active on social media or how many pictures of all the bathrooms you've shown that week. Not important to them. They don't care about your volunteer work. Now, again, don't have the takeaway say, Paige said not to volunteer. Volunteer work is important. One, because it's important to be in a servant community. Secondly, it is a great way to expand your network. So you're looking to expand your sphere, and a great way to do that is through volunteerism. But don't expect that somebody's going to read your bio and say, well, they volunteered for the Red Cross for nine years. I'm hiring them. But if you've been volunteering for the Red Cross for nine years, you should have a very intimate knowledge of that sphere, and you need to be farming that. What seller, how sellers find their agents. High on referral, high on repeat. Again, where are you spending your time looking for your sellers? Are you working, your, are you working the referrals? Guys, you hear it all the time. That is incredibly, incredibly important. I made a change to my business last year. My business last year was probably a third referrals, a third repeat, a third new. Um, I doubled down on my referrals. This year my business is 50% referrals. It matters. It works. It is the lowest hanging fruit because they already know you and they already like you. So it's an easy, it's an easy request in the sell. And because you're competent and you add value to the equation, they're happy to do that because it's helpful for them to be able to say, I know a great agent. Contact Paige. Really work that sphere. So here's the thing about repeat clients that's kind of interesting. And newbies, this is going to be a little hard for you. Um, used to be that sellers moved um, on average about every six years. New data says it's about every 10. So the buyer you closed last month probably isn't moving for another 10 years. That means you need to be in contact with them for 10 years. Because when the time is ready, if you're not there, somebody else will be. And in addition, in that whole time, they've had an experience with you. They've seen how great you are. And to keep them in your sphere and working that from a relationship perspective, that is how you grow long-standing relationships and do justice to your business. This is not a short-term game. This is a long-term game. And if you're willing to play that, you'll be successful. Once again, 74% contacted only one agent. I know we talk about, well, what happens when you've got to compete against 17 agents at a listing presentation? 
Well, first of all, if I find out there's 17 agents that are going, I'm not going. <laughs> they want to just hear 17 people tell them different prices on their house, and they're going to pick the highest, so <laughs> why am I going to waste my time? Most of the time, you're the only person at the table, which is why it is important to practice your scripts. How they did not find their agents. Direct mail, social media of any kind, newspaper or advertising gifts. So if these things are in your budget, you might want to think about how it's actually working. It's interesting to me these numbers are a little bit lower than what buyers say, largely because there's some 5% here, 7% here, 3% here, things that kind of add up. Um, but really what sellers care about, the reputation of the agent and trustworthiness. It goes back, it's very similar to what buyers are looking for. They are looking for a trusted advisor. 16% agent is a friend or family member. You better really make some good friends. Because if you're the friend, or you better have a big family. But if you're a friend, you got, you got a really good shot at that business. What they don't care about, they don't care about which firm you're with, and they don't care about the initials after your names. Here's the awesome part about Keller Williams, and the reason that I'm here, is that when I figured out that 97% of sellers did not care which firm I was with, but they cared what I could do for them, that made me shift. And what Keller Williams is great at is that they empower you to run your own business. They're not, Michael's not calling you every day, asking you if you've made your calls. Nobody's coming down on that. But your business is your business. And if you succeed, it's on you. And if you fail, it's also on you. So at the end of the day, the question is, why should someone hire you? If you can't answer this question, how can they? So a few tips, and then we'll get to some Q&A. Um, so tips to nourish your roots. First, we've talked a little bit about this. Be intentional in what you do. Um, when I moved to intentionality as a purpose of um, to gain my life back and, and how I could run my business, it has dramatically changed um, my day-to-day extravaganzas. Um, I'm no longer working till midnight because I'm intentional in how I do my business and how I run my calendars and what I run my day. Be bold. You're not always going to feel bold, but it doesn't mean that you can't step out there in faith and try it. And ultimately, you be confident. If you present, eh, I don't know, well, maybe, put it out there. Be confident. And you know what if you're not confident? Fake it till you make it. <laughs> ah, I keep turning off that screen. Establish a plan and a budget that you're willing to follow. Guys, if you put a plan in place and never execute against it, it's not even worth the time you spend on it. You're just better off doing what you've always been doing. And find a budget that you're willing to spend. But guys, I mean this. Do the ROI math. I don't want you spending every single dollar you make. That's not why you make it. And there are lots of people that have got their hands out trying to get into your pockets because they think, oh, there's so much money there. You work hard for that money. You keep that money. Spend what you need to promote your business, but at the end of the day, if you spend every penny you make, what's the point of what you're doing? Ultimately, this is a proven business model. Find a mentor or a process that you can follow. Again, not rocket science, but if you're willing to work through what the processes are, and the MREA book is great. If you've not read that, that is a step-by-step -step instruction novel of how you can get from point A to point Z, and it's brilliant. So a few tips for your fruit, and then I'll almost shut up. All right, so new agents, some strategies. And for agents who may want to change their business, find an agent who needs leverage, and then offer a business arrangement or an exchange program. So for example, if you're new to the business and you've got a dress suit and a full tank of gas, but nobody to show, Maybe you could find some agents around the office that actually need a showing partner. And you could be willing to be their showing partner and present their brand to the world in exchange for learning. That's a possibility. There's lots of ways when you start looking at how you can run your business and how you should run your business, you don't have to do it the traditional, I'm just an agent all on my own way. Find ways to learn, but whatever you do when you meet with these other agents, put it in writing. Make sure that the expectations are fair. Uh, new agents and inexperienced agents, you want to be able to offer something of value to these agents that are going to give you some, some lots of learning in the process. It's not a one-way street. I can't believe I keep doing that. Uh, organize your inbox. How many of you have got like a thousand emails in your inbox? 
Woo! That's some messed up headspace right there. Your day must feel like you've got a lot of chaos going on. Organize your inbox. It is the fastest, best way to stay organized in your business. There's lots of ways to do it. The way I do it is I have subfolders and numbered subfolders so that every buyer has a folder, every lead has a folder, every doctor's appointment has a folder. So I can find exactly what I can do because if my inbox has more than 20 emails in there, I am absolutely losing my mind because that is my to-do list. So find ways to organize your inbox. Set your clients up in matrix. We've talked about this. It used to be set them up in tempo. Now it's set them up in matrix. But here's the new thing that I want you to do. You need to call them. Because other people are now setting clients up. But did you bother to call and say, hey, did you see the house that I sent you? What did you think about it? What do you, uh, am I on the right track on your search? Because if you have them set up for a $250,000 house in Timber Grove, but really they want to be $250,000 in Katy, oh, well, they're not really reading your emails because you didn't listen. They want to be called. We saw the statistic that said they want to be called. Call, call, call. You only have to make two a day. So find excuses to call. What I do for recurring emails, so this is also a big time suck of mine. How many times do you send the same email over and over? Who the inspectors are, who the home warranty companies are, what do you do now that you're under contract, happy birthday, what's an IABS, blah, 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 blah. I have over 100 email templates that I use. Because I've written every single one of those emails time and time again, and I can either spend four hours a day rewriting what I write every day, or I can just set it up as a signature block. That's one of your easiest. Or also in Word, just set them up so you can go file them up, pick it up, drop it in, you're done. That's a huge time saver. We've talked about this. If you're not serious about building your online reviews, you need to get serious. While buyers and sellers do not go to social media to find you, they will look you up. And if they can't find anything on an agent, like for example, we've pulled up agents before, we're like, who is this person? There's no picture, there's no bio, there's no nothing, I can't find them on LinkedIn. Do, do they exist? You need to have an online presence. Does that have to be your all? No, because that's not what the numbers show that they care about. But they are gonna research them. And also, you need to research them as well. You need to know who you're meeting with so that you're, you're well prepared for that meeting. Meet new people. Can't stress this enough. You're going to still have to build your funnel with more than just repeats and referrals. So spend time making an effort going out and meeting new people because you've got to put them into your funnel. But before you meet the no new people, remember all those lines. How's the market? Are you busy? Yeah, know all your lines before you start doing that. How many of you have a sphere? Great. <coughs> When's the last time you called everybody on it? Never. See, it's, you've got to get to the point where you're willing to make the calls. I hate it. You hate it. It is the crux of our business. You have to be willing to step out there in faith and make the phone calls. Call your old leads. You know, the person that six months ago quit responding to your emails. Maybe you should call them. Again, you've got to find two people. So call your old leads. Call your previous clients to check in. How many of us have some clients, you know, been, haven't talked to them in three years? Man, they loved you three years ago. They haven't thought about you since because you didn't bother to stay in front of them. I touch everyone in my database. Every single one hears from me every 30 days until they tell me to leave them alone. Now, I have multiple scripts, multiple ways to do it, but until they say, stop it, lady, they're going to hear from me. And frankly, I want them to tell me stop it because if they're not going to engage with me and don't want to be in my database, I don't want them there either. You've got to be able to touch base with your people. And then ultimately, all the touching base is all fine and good. But unless you have a follow-up plan, none of it matters. You could have the best conversation with someone and then you just forget to send them the follow-up information on their home valuation. You forget to say, oh, I told you I was going to send you this information and I never did. You have got to determine what your follow-up plan is and actually execute it. It may be different for each situation. What I do on my calendar after I've met with somebody, 
there's always 30 minutes after that meeting that I designate to sit in my car and do whatever follow-up I need to do, even if it's to send myself an email for the things that I need to make sure that get done. I do no longer have the ability to retain it in my head. And after a long day driving around the city, being mad at people on the road, trying to get into the lockbox, oh gosh, I forgot the alarm code and here's CSS, you're not going to remember either. We talked about response times, how important that is. Guys, 15 minutes. It's tough. It's tough. One tip you may have is if you want to take a day off, find a partner. Let them have your phone. Let them have your email. And say, look, well, do you mind watching this stuff for me today? Um, you don't have to, in 15 minutes, give them a big, long, perfect email. You just need to say, I heard you, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. That alone will stop them from moving on. But if you ignore them and they don't hear from you, they're going to the next. And then ultimately where I want you to get to, and this is real important in all these meetings and conversations you're having, you need to find a way to add value. My goal when I meet and talk to people is to figure out what is a way I can follow up with them of value. Is it they want home information, they want neighborhood trends, they want school information, whatever it is, that is something that's important because it gives me an excuse to follow up. And lots of times, my follow-up excuse has nothing to do with real estate. But I have their business card and their email, and they can go in my database, and I can do a little research to figure out where they live and start spamming them with stuff because they've given me the information. And then they're mine until they tell me to stop. So find ways to add value and to follow up. And if you add value outside of your profession, that's when you're a winner. Right? You have a meeting, not really a place for real estate. You kind of talk about some referral stuff. But ultimately, the, the fact of the matter is they're tied up because their sister's coming in to the med center to see a specialist on something. And you happen to know the nurse, and you can make a connection. Man, that's powerful. When you add value outside of your profession, it increases your stock in your profession of what you do, and they will think of you more often. All right, so let's talk about what Michael said, uh, my, my, my goal. I'm looking for about, these are my shameless plug of, of what I'm looking for here. And, and before uh, we move on, just for the heck of it, we can let her do this part, and I can hold off on giving you the four cars that are about to get towed. Oh, no, cars, oh, no, tow. Do the car? All right. Tell, yes. All right, so uh, who's the lucky winner of uh, a white infinity? License plate JZY. Five nine zero zero. Okay. Uh, but who's got a Porsche? Blue. All right. You might want to move that. Um, uh, you got a Hyundai? Red? No, nah, this looks like Hyundai. This is bad handwriting. And then it could be a Marzetti or a Maserati black. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if that's one of your cars, you might want to might want to take care of that. It can't be Mercedes. No one can spell that bad. OK. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Paige. So right. on the other slide, it's a, if you're in the position of, I, 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 I'm happy to make two calls, but I don't, I don't have anybody to call. So that's exactly the kind of people we're looking to add for, to our network. Um, that said, we have some specific qualifications. Most we won't talk about. But on the whole, short list is, I'm looking for agents who have an incredible work ethic. If you don't want to work hard, please don't contact me. Uh, a reputation of putting your clients first. I care about that extremely. And if you don't, I don't want to hear from you. If you don't have a desire to learn and grow, also, please don't contact me. And lastly, what I'm looking for is an open mind, a kind heart, a fun spirit, and drama free. I do not, do not, do not do drama. That's for Bravo TV only. So if you think you're a fit, if you'll email me with the five things, what's your production over the last year, where do you live, how long have you been in the business, why you think you'd be a fit as a referral partner, and include your disc and KPA. And with that, I think I've talked your ear off. Thank you, Paige. You're welcome. Yeah, can we go ahead and, uh, as we're talking, can you just go back on that yeah, last screen? Yeah, sure can. Yes, this is all being saved. Okay, um, and she's serious about those five things. That is an easy way to weed somebody out because you included three. <laughs> and KPA and DISC, email Brenda. We'll get you taken care of. All right, so here, here's the fun thing about the KPA. May I share this page? Sure. 
Okay. So KPA did. Uh, Paige did her KPA. KPA is just like anybody take an SAT test. It's like that on steroids, and you haven't been in school for a while. Some of you. It's a rough test where you learn. You see this. And you see this microphone, and they have it wrapped around. And you have to figure out how it all expands. You you have to look at spatial relationships. Vocabulary is a part of it. Thank God I was taking it with an Alexa next to me. <laughs> um, but but the point is, it's not. It, it it's you, it's a brain teaser for 20, 30 minutes maybe. I think they say up to an hour. Okay, so so that said, we can we can do that for you. So Paige took it, and the cool thing is, it breaks out real estate related functions that you would be good at. So of all of them, she was really high percentage wise, except for mega agent, where, where did you finish? Low, and I'm not a fit for an agent either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she won't be a good agent, and she won't be a good mega agent. All right, so <laughs> that just lets you know that even though, the, I, when you get your results, don't freak out, but it does really parlay well with your disc. And when you start looking at it and understanding what it means, it means I have to work harder and augment parts of my business to m make up for what I lack. You can still do the job, but you've got to find ways to, to build that in. Um, but yeah, so I, I should probably never be in the business and probably should get out real quick. How, how, about, how about tomorrow? Does that sound good? Oh, uh, get out of the business tomorrow. Please don't. <laughs> Wait till I retire. <laughs> Once I retire, you can retire. So another thing that she mentioned, it's not part of the questions that we have in place, but she mentioned your presentation styles and knowing this. This is a preparation game. Years ago when we created our KW Power Lister page, was on the team that helped us design that. I know she doesn't take credit for it, but she was that original inspiration when we created that presentation. That is an awesome presentation that you That's have. Awesome. They don't have it other KWs. Use it, learn it. Who knows KW Power Lister? Because I pay you $200 to do a presentation for me. Exactly what she just mentioned. Are you presenting, are you learning what you need to know so that when you get the job interview of listing someone's house, you're ready to do it. Are you competent? And if you're not, you don't deserve to be a referral partner of Pages. You gotta learn this stuff and it's all here for you. So I would suggest if you haven't done it, don't bother emailing her because you have to know what you're doing. And there's about half this room that does and about half that does not. You decide which half you're on, okay? Now you can do this and learn it in two days, right? Or less, okay. Sorry to be so tough, but I just know what she's looking for. All right, so Paige, your first year, and that was in 2000, about 2004, you did one closing. We all know about that, but the big question that I get from everybody is, how did you keep mentally prepared to go into year two when your first year, I mean, you, you didn't hit it out of the park? No, I didn't. Um, year two, I did what most every other agent does, is I changed brokerages expecting that a new broker would change my business. And I did that again at year four, um, until I finally figured out it's my responsibility to bring in business. If I'm going to a shop and a firm expecting somebody else to bring business to me, um, then I'm not going to succeed in this business. Um, so that was, um, so yeah, what I did was I just changed firms, I changed firms again. And it was when I was at a different firm and a friend of mine was here, we interviewed at diff each other's shops and she brought me to family reunion and that blew my mind away and that was really the catalyst for me to go, I'm such a dummy, uh, wow. But yet I'm a, a little slow to move so I was a dummy for an additional year and then I made the move over here and that's been eight years. So there you go, guys. It's not the company. There's a company right now, iPro Realty. They are emailing all of you. If you, got, if you haven't gotten the email right now, you should be like, gosh, why didn't I get it? And they're <laughs> like this online company. We'll give you leads. They're going to give you crap leads. Sorry for anyone that's listening. It's not real, right? And that's not what this business is about. That's not sustainable. We're going to teach you how to do your business, but you've got to utilize the tools like PowerLister. All right, Paige, so what follow-up techniques do you use with your clients? You mentioned how important follow-up is. Mm -hmm. What does that really look like, and when do you do it? 
So I have a ton of follow-up and it's always consistent. We talked about touching everybody every 30 days. Um, I have a variety of email drip campaigns that go out depending on sort of the nature of the lead um, and staying in touch. I also have phone call campaigns that go out. Um, so like I said, everybody's touched a minimum of 30 days until they say, stop it, lady. Um, but I do think you, it's, it's, for me, it is important to tailor those campaigns. Um, if something is better than nothing, um, but when you get to the point of really needing some assistance, um, I think you, at that point you're looking for some CRMs that you can customize. My philosophy is I used Outlook for a long time, still do, that's my, my, my main um, way of my email blocks and planning. But I think you can use Outlook probably to be your CRM till you get to probably about 500 in your database. And after the outside of that, it probably grows and it's a little bit harder. But if you're not familiar with all of what Outlook does, there are tons of YouTube videos that sort of show how to handle last contact date and mail merge and calendar integration. So there's some really good tools that can help you be prodded along. Because I found out that personally, kind of on my handwritten sketch pads, I could probably mentally handle five to seven leads and do the follow-up. But if you're really gonna do a lot of business, you're gonna have to have a bigger funnel and have things more automated. You mentioned expanding on Matrix, and you've told us over the last several times that you've come in, specifically what she does when she meets somebody, she puts them in a drip campaign. Mm -hmm. And it's a drip campaign for their neighborhood, not for where they're going, because a lot of people she meets have no interest in buying or selling right now. So it's a preparatory. Now you said expand on that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, so what I my goal is, that it, right, not everybody you're gonna meet is gonna be a buyer and seller, but it doesn't mean they can't now become a part of your sphere and ultimately become a referral source for you. Well, one of the best ways I've found to increase my referral source was to be able to give people information about the neighborhood of where they are, market stats on their current house, uh, and provide helpful, hey, do you need a vendor, do you need this, do you need that, just as a, I'm just a, your helpful little realtor. Um, and over time, what that does is it keeps me in front of them. So A, when they're ready to buy or sell, which usually is in several years, I have a shot at the business. But in the meantime, because I'm calling them and staying in front, I'm more likely to get a referral out of that. Now you said you really call your people every 30 days. It, yeah, let's see. I have over 15,000 people in the database. Um, again, I have a large referral network. I need five more agents to make phone calls. There's 4,000 people sitting in my database that need to be called today. Is that exciting? Is that, okay. So now how do you talk to people about conversations that are not gonna be happy necessarily? What is a, like a price reduction? I feel adamantly that my price of a million dollars on my property is worth it. Yeah, so first of all, I'm, I'm kind of a Debbie Downer um, and when we price properties, if they want to be dramatically overpriced, I don't even take the listing. Um, they're just going to be mad at me at, by the end of it because all I'm going to be doing is hammering them for a price reduction. And they're going to say, well, why, what have you done for me lately? And I'm like, well, I've done all this, but you still haven't listened. And um, so um, I set people up with my first initial price reduction conversation to happen at two weeks after the listing goes live. And I prep them at that first meeting that if we have not had so many showings or an offer within two to three weeks that I'm going to be discussing moving the price um, because more than likely they have chosen a price that is within the realm of which I think is appropriate but on the high side and while our market is I think this is going to be a busy year um, and while we're not what we were in 2015 where it was like go 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 you got two seconds to see the house and you got to make an offer I do think it's still going to be robust enough and then certainly in certain areas so preparing those sellers to be able to sell their house and move on what they're hiring you for is to get the highest possible price in the shortest amount of time so if you're missing the time mark you're doing them a disservice and the best way you can do that is get it to the price where a buyer will actually accept it so uh, a lot of emphasis was put on these referral agents that Paige is looking for, the ones that she has in place, are very successful. Um, you just came back from Costa Rica. You took your team kind of for a, a revamping. So no doggle, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, that says, kind of think about the image that Paige is looking for. Think about your social media and what that looks like and what kind of message you're sending because I she's going to look at it. I'm probably breaking a taboo rule, but I you should she's probably going to look at it. TV shot isn't the best thing to have on there. 
Well, and your clients are going to look at it. So anybody, I mean, when's the last time you've been to a meeting and didn't Google somebody to just sort of see, do I know what they look like before I walk into the meeting? Is this appropriate? And so, you know, if you're presenting an image to the world, and let me tell you, there ain't nothing private on social media. I don't care what your settings are. Somebody knows somebody, somebody screenshots something. There is nothing private. So if it's out there, it is out there for the entire world to see. And if that is not the way you want to present yourself, then don't put it up there. I'm sorry, we don't have the luxury, in my opinion, of being like, this is all fun, and this is who I am outside of work, and this is who I am at work. They're kind of the same. And so if you want to attract a certain clientele, you need to make sure that this all matches. All right, so we had several of you that had questions. Uh, open mic, and please <laughs> wait for the mic. And please be gentle. I, don't ask any hard questions. I don't know the answers. Um, I'm Olga. Um, so I have a question regarding, you mentioned um, not, not being a good idea for somebody to say you work everywhere in town with two larger city, but say you're starting, you, you don't want to give up, <laughs> you know, like I work in Katy, I work in East Houston, Edo, I don't care, I want my business. So do you, do you discourage this kind of practice or you just, the way you um, relay the information is a little bit different? Well, I think it depends, A, what you're willing to do and accomplish. And yes, when you're new in the business, you do kind of have to hustle and sometimes go where the business takes you. But tailor your script. So before I start going into who, who I am and what I do, I ask a lot of questions. Because if I find out that they live in Katy, I'm probably not going to say I work in the woodlands. Because I've lost that relationship right there if I'm trying to, to do that. So ask questions, find out that person of where they're coming from. Um, and then you certainly can say, I often say, you know, I mean, I'm very geographic specific because I'm not driving to Conroe to show a house or to list a property. I, I don't even know how to get there. And so, <laughs> and it would be unfair of me from an integrity perspective to tell somebody that I, that I do. And so I very much think you should be somewhat geographically specific, and I think you would grow your business if you would actually focus on the area that you want to work with and in that area so that when you're meeting people, you can say, I work in or loop. You don't have to say just the heights or just this. You can give a little bit larger of an area, but I think if you say, I work everywhere from here to there, it's very hard for somebody to take you seriously on that. It, and how can you be the neighborhood expert in Conroe? or Galveston, and I know, hey, I'm working my first deal, I need that money. But we also have a showing agent program, and they will gladly do it for $25 an hour or 25% of the commission. You still keep the majority of it. Well, and, the neighborhood and heck, expert. heck, you find a referral agent in the office and say, hey, you know that area, I don't. Can I tag along, let you be the expert, split it 50-50, find a way to build your knowledge base, or just refer it off completely, because if you sell that house, Remember, you're trying to build a network and relationships. So if you sell in some place that you're never going back to, you have, yeah, you've made a quick buck, but you've lost the long game. So that's why I think it's really important to hone that down. Gold? When you had mentioned how long you should say you've been in the business, mm -hmm. I was in the mortgage business for 33 years. So you've been in the business for 33 years. That, that's, that was my question. Been around the, I've been around the real estate business for 33 years. I noticed that in roughly 50% of your listings that are in the seven digits, they all went under contract in less than a month. And my biggest question I wanted to pose to you is, how are you able to fill these houses that really only a finite of people can really afford to be in in such a short amount of time? Because typically from what I see in that price range, it's months until you find a buyer. Unless you price it right. So that's all in the pricing. It's all in the pricing. I no will tell specific, you, like, I, I don't do long-term relationships. Yeah. And so if some, if I look at, <laughs> other than my husband, but I'm not signing up to list your house for two years. Um, I don't care. So, so let me give you some perspective when we're talking about this high-end market. There are 70,000 homes about in Houston, Texas that sell every year. There are 70 that sell above $3 million. So I talked last year how my, my business decreased when you're working that higher end market you need to know what the average days on market looks like because they either sell real fast because you priced it right or we're doing a real long dance 
and I don't have it in me, I'm too much of a gypsy to be in a relationship with a client for two years and I would rather refer that to somebody else who does have the patience, who does want to do it and let me chase other things. And, and Paige, you're not afraid to walk away from a deal. So you could be saying in your seats, well, that's great for Paige, you can walk away because she does a billion dollars in business. But still, she's stuck with that pattern since I've seen her. When she came over, she wasn't doing 63 million. But I have to sleep at night, um, and my sanity matters to me. And the thing that I learned early in my career is that the hardest deals um, you learn a lot from, but they're emotionally taxing for me. And so at this point in my career in my life, not to say that I'm not afraid of hard work, but I try to weed out the situations that I know is going to be a problem up front, because especially if I'm having the dialogue with that buyer or seller and know that, that, that that's where this is headed, I would rather just continue to be friends. And in that perspective, the best thing I can do is refer them on to an agent who's better equipped to help them than I am. Hi, Paige. I'm Murad Fiki. Uh, the question I have, I, I've been having a lot of difficulty in staying in front of my database and, and asking for referrals. I feel more comfortable cold calling. So I need to get over this limiting belief. How do you specifically, with a, a database of 15,000, how do you specifically personally stay in front of them and, and specifically ask to be referred? Well, I don't make cold calls. Everybody in my database I know. So, and I'm terrible at cold calls, by the way. Uh, I would, so you, if that is your strength and your skill set, and you know those scripts, that may be the best way that you can hit that and, and take that further. I think it goes back to know thyself, know what you're good at, and know what you're not. If you're struggling with building the relationships, my encouragement to you would be, you can start with a cold call, but you need to push to a meeting as quickly as you can and be willing to sit down and spend face-to-face -face time with them. I am much better face-to-face -face than I am on the phone, so my calls with them are very brief. A lot of times it's just a message with a follow-up email that said, hey, left you a message, just checking in, anything I can be doing to help you. Um, I'm not constantly always asking for referrals. I'm looking to see how the conversation ebbs and flows um, because, again, I'm trying to build a, a relationship with them, and if I'm constantly saying, refer me, refer me, refer me, that's not great, but if I can push those calls to a meeting at that meeting, and I'm able to have an hour with them, then out of that time, I'm able to say, how can I help you? And then, oh, by the way, I just closed a deal. I have a new gap in my client roster. If you know anybody that is looking to buy or sell, I would love to spend time with a friend of yours or family member because I know that I can help them out. So that's typically how I do it um, because I'm just trying to plant the seed. Sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, Susie Q is blah, blah, blah. But for me, the whole point of my 30-day system is I am staying in front of them 30 days. They're going to get an email. They're going to get a newsletter. They're going to get a call. They're every So I'm more likely to just be referred because I'm present. It's not necessarily because I'm doing a song and dance all of the time. So that's why when we talk about that first time buyer, you got 10 years to be present. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to spend every other month with them, but they probably need to see you about once a year. And for my core sphere, um, they do see me once or twice a year face to face. And that is the majority of what my business comes from. And let's expand on that. You're Marketing budget, how much of it, what, what does that look like yeah. and what is it dedicated to? So 50% um, of my marketing budget is spent on client relationships, face-to-face -face meetings, taking them to dinner, spending time with them, building that relationship. For, for me, that's very important. One, it's also how I enjoy operating. So 50% of my budget goes to that. 40% goes to strategic gift deliveries, not knickknacks. They're not getting a magnet. They are getting a very specific... Um, mail out, I do them four times a year, that is designed to wow them and be shareable at the office. So that happens four times a year, and then 10% is digital, so uh, newsletters, email, things of that nature. So 50, 40, 10. I'm looking for a three to one ROI, um, so with the concept of 1% is what it probably costs me to do it, so I need, I need to recoup that, I need to recoup the cost of my time, and then 1% being the profit. I hope you guys heard that because in it, sometimes it's easy to get lost in Paige's website and think, oh my gosh, it's just that. That had nothing to do with her website. 10% was that. Can you provide an example of the uh, client gift? Um, I did uh, popcorn tins from a uh, up-and-coming popcorn place in Fayetteville, Arkansas and had them all shipped. Everybody got big tins 
of popcorn from me. Thank you. It'll be shared at the office so that everyone gets to see Paige's information. Mm -hmm. uh, going back, going back to when you first started, um, when your business was slow, around one million dollars, and you said you went to family reunion and a light bulb went off. Can you can you put the mic a little closer? Sorry. Kim. Uh, when you went to family reunion and a light bulb went off, uh, is there something in particular, maybe one or two things that you did in particular to grow your business from two to four million, four to eight million? or to grow your database in the very beginning when you're just getting started? Oh, well, I didn't have a database. I mean, I had an Outlook and some contacts in there, but I didn't, I never worked my database. I mean, I, I, did, I mean, I, they're like, work your sphere, work your sphere, and I'm like, what do you, what do, you do? What do you mean? <laughs> um, and it never crossed my mind, and the people who've heard me tell the story, this is not new, it never crossed my mind that I needed to be intentional about my business. I just assumed that if you're in it long enough, people would know who you were, and business would happen for you magically. I was looking for that magic pill, which is why I changed agencies all the time. What I learned at Family Reunion was, it is my responsibility. So at that point, I started to take time to connect with my sphere, started making phone calls, and I wasn't great at it, but I just started taking the steps. And, and guys, this again, it's a long game. So you, know, you don't have to do that much. It's two calls a day to get you to $4 million of production. $4 million gives you $100,000. That's fantastic. Okay, so you wanna make $200,000. That's four calls a day. So uh, if you just break it down, those are really the ways to focus. And that's what I would spend my time in, is how to meet the people and how to spend the time networking out of those things and goal mine, goal, mining for goal out of that than spending your time doing other things that are not necessarily profitable. Hi, Paige, Wanda Baptista. Um, how much time do you think when you did come back to Keller, or come to Keller Williams, did you spend actually learning, relearning how to be a real estate agent using the tools? Did it take a year? the scripts, hmm. how much time did you dedicate to learning versus lead generating? Um, I think lead generation is always important. And that was certainly something that I didn't do before I moved here. Um, and certainly something that I started doing once I got here. Um, I think the scripts, I probably, I also, when I came here, uh, when I moved over, I took bold and bold was really great for me. Um, I hated calling expires and FISBOs. Again, terrible at cold calls, um, but the basic of the scripts and just the repetitive nature of that um, through bold I felt like I got a pretty good crux of that and I will tell you you're always still learning I mean I'm going to family reunion again this year because I'm looking for two new scripts on how to say a couple things that I'm struggling with in my own business and I just want to be able to say it better and you'll be sitting through a presentation somebody's gonna say it and they're like yes that's it I mean, one of the scripts that I learned recently that I love is that um, some, you know, somebody's trying to give you a hard time on pricing and they're not, or, or you know, struggling to li to, with a buyer and they're, you're combating at things. And my answer is always, look, um, you know, we can, I appreciate that this is what you want to do. That is not something that I can do or am willing to do. Um, and I would rather part friends than disappoint you later. Well, all of a sudden that typically kind of, Wait, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't want, want to work with me? Uh, I'd rather be your friend. I, I, you know, so that for me, and I use that a lot, especially in hard conversations. I don't overly like having difficult conversations, but it's our business and our job to have that a lot. And I use that. Look, I'd rather part friends, especially if it's a listing and it's a situation that's awkward or not going well. Um, I'll let them out of that listing agreement early. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll part friends than to have to deal with some some bad stuff for six more months where I can't sleep. Yes, Miss Cindy. And, and guys, she mentioned a few times about going to family reunion. So many of you may not even know about this. You kind of just erase the emails. That is KW's mega convention where the top of the top, the best of the best, are going to be doing different classes on what they excel at. So she's going to find her scripts. They're going to have incredible listing presentations, buyer presentations, um, different pieces of the business. It, I don't even know what it runs. It's probably about six fifty, seven hundred bucks. Okay, seven hundred fifty. Money well spent. Money well spent. And and it's something where it's going to be in Anaheim this year. Uh, there might even be a few tickets left. It sells out pretty quick. Typically, it's going to be in the next three weeks. If you can go, go. If you can't make it this time, go to Mega Camp. But Family Reunion will be next year somewhere, and they're going to have 
you know, 20 different breakout sessions where you will learn from people that are making millions Money well spent. Well, Age goes and, and others and go. And when you talk about competency, it's a great way to, to pick up some competency. Um, there's also, I think, an online version of Family Reunion that if you can't go there, you might be able to pay a subscription fee and watch some of the things. Um, I'm buying it here. Here's the challenge. It's on a Sunday here in this room, right? I mean, on a Sunday, typically, we'll have two people walk in, and one of them will be the receptionist. You should come to this because I'm going to spend $800 to have it here. Yeah, but totally worth it. You'll yeah. fill it. You'll fill a notebook full of ideas and you will have so many ideas coming out of that that you're like I don't know where to start. What so Sunday is it? The 6th, 16th, 17th, somewhere in there. February? So, we're going to have it here. It's it's going to be like 3 days of it. Um, I decided when she started talking about it that we were going to get it, told Brenda. So, we're going to order it here. We will let you know if you can't go there come here. You will not have all the breakout sessions, but you'll have some great information and the things she's talking about will happen. Spend the time here. Okay, Paige. I didn't add the why. Um, you know, the last time I was in this class from you, you gave the invaluable information of, you know. Yes, but I don't have another one of those to give you. No, no, no. I don't mean that. I don't mean that. The, um, I'm talking about the uh, HAR thing that you do with the subdivision. The the signing your clients up for Matrix. Yes. Yeah. But it's different now. I mean, they threw away all my clients. Yeah, so HAR notified us all that they were going to be transferring everything over to, and they should be, if they should have transferred automatically. You're talking about the gateway? The gateway. Uh, I, I don't know if gateway transferred or the other one. Uh, so call HAR? You can, if, now they didn't transfer anything over that it had expired. So if you had a bunch of expired things sitting in HAR, they didn't transfer, but no, the I active ones. No, I understand. But yeah, um, I would call them. Call Matrix or HAR? Uh, call HAR and, and they, can, they can put you in touch with somebody who but can answer that question. For everyone who doesn't know what you guys are talking about, it's the drip campaign. It's the drip campaign so wait, through, through Matrix. Years ago when Paige started telling us, everybody went out and did it, and they started getting people into drip campaigns for their neighborhoods. When we switched MLSs, well, now we need to just get them transferred over. If you haven't done that, I guess yeah, I would, I would I would call HAR and see see why they didn't transfer. Okay. Um, the next thing is, I just want to share with everybody the kind of client dinner parties that you have. Okay. Paige invited me over for dinner. She sent a car to pick me up. I mean, I felt like such princess. Kate, <laughs> by the time I left, that, I mean, she had a cook. I mean, it was just an amazing experience. So I can only imagine what a client experience would be like. I spend a lot of time with my clients in as intimate of settings as possible because for me that is my best way to build relationships. And when you go back to measuring what you're good at and knowing where your business comes from, for me, that's a big driver. Okay, and the yeah, but before before you got to that, before you could afford to do that, what might that experience have looked like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want to I don't want to ostracize the room. <laughs> well, wait a second. We, I don't we, think she ch spent spend, very much money we spend, on me. We we spend a lot of time with coffees, and then um, and typically um, would have a after closing. My goal is always to take the clients out to dinner. Um, or have host a dinner party or something that as a just a celebratory yay this is fun because my goal is just because we're done doesn't mean we're done but how cool would that be to have a car pick them up to dinner not everyone has a chef yeah but, but you have an uber know. app and you that's can right. send uber for them uh, the high end uber right or the yeah. lift okay that's right mm -mm. Okay. It is pretty cool, and you always think outside of the box like that to make the experience pretend, and you well, always have. And that's one of the fun things about going to family reunion again is that those are the kind of, you'll hear some strange off-the-wall ideas that you're like, I never thought about that. That's a great idea. Uh, that was so cool. Okay. The last thing is don't laugh. <laughs> Do you always dress like that? <laughs> well, I either I dress mean, like this or I wear yoga pants, so there's not a so whole lot in of in-between. So, in other words, if you wear regular slacks, does it... I wear, I, wear, I wear slacks. I almost always wear a jacket um, because I just I just do. Yeah, was I'm always question. cold. Yeah. All right, Bobby. Paige. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. 
you have a an amazing website, a truly amazing website. I use it a lot for my clients. Uh, how long have you had that, and um, how much lead generation does that provide for you? Um, that is probably less than a, that's probably one-fourth of my business, so not that large. I've had it for 15 years, um, and I spend a tremendous amount of money keeping that up. So um, I would say from a, n a single agent, uh, investment that is not necessarily something I would recommend you invest in it's something you can invest in over time I think at some point the cheese will move and what I've got there won't be relevant anymore and I would much rather see you spend time building your referrals and your repeat business because that you know the numbers are there anybody yes Hi, Paige. Hey. Um, my question is, I keep hearing you referring to, I guess, is building your own brand in a sense because I use the CRM for KW. And, you know, that provides us with all of our campaigns. And everyone that I have in my database, which is 250 people, mm -hmm. are receiving campaigns. So should I continue that or should I opt out and get my own thing going? I think at this point you probably want to continue doing what you're doing. Um, I think it's a great brand. It sort of depends on where you want to go and how you want to do it. It's going to be hard to replicate what KW does on your own for such a small scale of 250. Okay. So for me, I have my own system because I've sort of cobbled it together and built it way before Keller Williams had a lot of the things. So my stuff was already in the works, which is why I have what I have. Okay. Um, but I think what Keller Williams offers is great. Um, and I certainly would either use their branded material or what HAR can provide, which are some free resources from, from, from the Matrix Drip and sort of some Oh, what are they called? Um, market snapshots, things of that nature. Top well, producer is yeah. a comparable to, yeah, yeah. to E Edge. Now, KW has invested $54 million this year in their CRM, which is really, really cool. And Garrett yeah. and I got to go down and take a look at it. We've talked about it. This is going to tell you who the last person you've been emailing back and forth to or when you should email that next person. It's very intelligent. They've committed $50 million a year for the next five years to this. They're rolling it out. It's pretty quick here. We're one of the beta sites. We've got to take a look at it. It's going to parlay with whatever CRM you're using, whether it's ES, Top Producer, whatever it is, it'll piggyback with it. We've got some cool things coming that will tell you who that person is you should be contacting because you all have admitted we're not real great at the follow-up portion. Yeah, and I would say don't reinvent the wheel if the wheel's already been rolling and doing. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And I wasn't sure if I was going to say this, but shameless plug. Well, I love Paige. She's been a great inspiration, you know, throughout my career. She's really helped me a lot. Um, but it's been really great to hear her really talk about working by referral and how to grow your, refer your business by referral. So I just wanted to say we do have peak producers coming up. Right. Um, it starts right. March 19th. <laughs> Good. In our office, it's, it's working by referral. It's a 12-week program. It's really great for everybody here listening to this and wondering how to work by referral. Mm -hmm. Sign up for the program. It's, um, I sent an email out earlier today. You should have gotten it. You can register through there. Perfect. And um, it's yeah. really a great way And it's way got to some scripts that's going to really help you with that if you're wondering what to say and when to say it. And I will, again, do a full reimbursement. Every time you get a deal, we'll reimburse you $50. Every time you get it, and it's a 12-week program, so for 12 weeks, we'll do that reimbursement program. The agents that have taken that and Bold have done very well. It's a different program than Bold. I encourage you to do peak producers, and that is not a KW program, and I'm encouraging you to do it as leadership of KW to not do a KW program. <laughs> I'm here. Me? Thanks. I'm over here. Sorry. Okay. Kind of hiding. Hi, Hi Paige. Hi. I'm Tiffany. Um, I had a question about when choosing your next referral partners, what are what is one, one thing or a few things that either you're specifically looking for or is that you're or maybe something you're trying to bring in that you want to do differently no nope. someone might um, and those are things that I really don't talk about in in public largely because we just get so bombarded and everybody's trying to tell me what they think they want me to know mm -hmm. um, and I want 
Uh, my partners are, uh, we're a good match because we're a good match. And um, so I will tell you probably one out of five agents that we start down the process with works out. The other four do their own business and it's great. Um, we part friends and all of that as well. But to kind of every situation is a little bit different. So if you're interested in just email and go through the process and the process will take care of itself. Thanks. Welcome. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. I'm Debbie Cash. Um, I, as much as you're doing business, you must have a lot of units, a lot of transactions. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep track of all that to make sure everything goes nice and smooth? Yeah, so this year I've invested in establishing a VA um, transaction team on the back end um, that sort of helps me make sure that all the compliance is where it needs to be uploaded, taking care of things. Um, so that's helped me a tremendous amount just in terms of leveraging my time for a virtual uh, transaction coordinator. I, you've got some of those resources here at the office that I think are great to, to utilize. Um, I can manage a lot. I'm sort of um, used to managing a lot, but yeah, you can't manage it all all the time. And that's what I've that sort of helped make the difference. I also typically partner with a showing specialist or a listing specialist um, on each of my deals to help a little bit more leverage just so that people have resources if they can't immediately reach me. Okay, so being a lender, I'm gonna ask you even something different. So um, the realtors feel that they've got, to, like how do you handle when people don't wanna use the your, your preferred team? And I don't mean your transaction people, but say, title companies, loan officers, because I'm sure you're trying to keep a, a tight group yeah. for the better communication. Yeah, so my, my, my preference is always to use um, um, partners, title companies, lenders that we know and trust, because ultimately you're really needing a good partner to make sure things don't get screwed up on the back end. That makes your job so much easier than if you get to a situation and, and you know stuff falls apart. Um, but it, it's at the end of the day, it's their choice. And so we have a hard conversation about, especially when it comes to a lender, and they're picking a lender that's from New York, um, and they can never get them on the phone. My answer is, great, let me tell you this. When you sign this contract, you are responsible for every term in this, including all the dates. Your lender is not a party to the contract. So if they screw it up for you, you have ramifications where you could lose your earnest money or be sued. Both of those are bad. I can't control them, I can't control what they do, and I have no leverage over them because we're not partners. So you're welcome to use whoever you want to use. That is, it's your money, it's your interest rate, it's your closing costs. I will support you 100%, but just know there's some risk in using people who are not familiar with how things work in Texas. Could, could you imagine trying to deliver something like that without practicing it first? And so many of us in this room, and I'm not saying you, I'm saying the person next to you, does this <laughs> every day. You haven't taken the time to digest it and learn it and deliver it, right? All of that's important. Every piece of this is important. This is not a wing it game, although I have a lot of people winging it, and I have the occasional person that does cap by just winging it. I'm telling you not to do that. We have it all here. All right, so any other questions? The 50 people that are watching this at home would love to hear you, though, Oz. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name's Ozzy. Yes. Um, I, I have the honor and privilege of having the mail folder that's right behind Paige. And that has been my <laughs> motivation. <laughs> because when I first started here, I would go to my empty folder, and behind me would be sitting this bull honking fat folder full of checks and it would always have Paige Martin and occasionally the concierge would place one of her envelopes in my <laughs> folder and my happy peppy little body would go <gasps> and then it would have Paige on there and so that was my motivation to cap and <laughs> and so I had the honor of capping with the motivation of Paige and then I got to follow it with Jen Tran and um, Buffini so if I can tell you anything follow these two as a motivation mm -hmm. and you will be a capper really soon thank you Ozzy oh, that's wonderful All right. Do not take my mailbox away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ozzy always gets upset when we get someone that has initials that are in between his and Paige's. <laughs> so we have our, our preferred partners have set up some nice 
beverages in the in in our lobby um, with some cheese and so go out and Paige will be out there as well we'd like to mingle with you and get yep. to know you yep right, I'll thanks. stand out there and answer questions as long as you guys want to talk all right and, and guys because there's so many of us you can come on back in here as well with your drinks That was our best. You were so prepared. <laughs> How did you really go? Huh? You, you, you know that I like. Uh, I like.